I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, Mayor Bob Filner responds to a recall notice, citing his accomplishments and warning San Diegans not to move backward. We'll have a look at what the mayor's gotten done since taking office. I'm Peggy Pico. San Diego has been through shakeups in the mayor's office before. We'll look at what effect they've had on the city. And we'll look at new efforts in San Diego to prevent injury in school sports. And summer camp is a common experience, but a San Diego school is hosting campers from half a world away. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner has responded to a recall notice. The 300-word statement makes no mention of the sexual harassment claims made against him or of other controversies, such as his recent trip to Paris and a developer's $100,000 payment, allegedly in return for some city property. Filner writes, now is not the time to go backwards, back to the time when middle-class jobs and neighborhood infrastructure were sacrificed to downtown special interests. He mentions his accomplishments in office, and he says, as your mayor, I'm committed to moving San Diego forward. It's a line his chief of staff repeated at a Lions Club event today. KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks was there. Sandia, what did Lee Burdick have to say? She admitted that these are turbulent times in the city, but she talked about the mayor's vision for San Diego, focusing on policy over scandal. She says the mayor believes in strong neighborhoods, in strong environmental initiatives, and she says he is still trying to get a binational San, Di San Diego Tijuana Olympics off the ground. Did she talk by any chance about the sexual allegations at all? Sort of. She touched on issues related to it. She says it was her who had the locks changed at the mayor's office while uh, he was gone. She didn't want to make room for allegations of evidence tampering. So while the mayor is gone, his office remains shut. Burdick also asserted it was her working with the mayor who established the policy that no women can be alone with him. She says the city attorney was also working on a similar policy, but she insists it was the mayor and herself who came up with it. I understand that she wasn't taking questions from the press, but she did do a question and answer session with the audience. Were there any questions that you thought were telling? Well, you know, the audience seemed to be asking questions from both sides. One man asked if this, if all these allegations, is a witch hunt. Burdick said no. She said they are serious allegations that deserve full inquiry. But she says due process will bring justice. On the other side, an audience member said, you know, look, a good vision is one thing, but it needs a strong, capable leader to implement it. And he asked in the wake of all this controversy if that's even possible for Filner. Burdick told him that the mayor can still function as a strong leader, but maybe be not in such a strong-armed way. She says he just can't yell at city council anymore. The take-home message, the mayor seems to be staying to fight, and he is hoping talking about policy can take the place of the swirling scandals of the past month. KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks. Thanks, Sandia. Now, as we mentioned, the mayor's recall response mentions things that he's gotten done since taking office back in December. It does not mention the many controversies and downtown disputes. KPBS reporter John Rossman has this look back. I think we mark a new day for the beginning of our city. After a, uh, nearly a decade of crises and cutbacks, we finally have a chance to look ahead, begin planning for a brighter future. Former Congressman Bob Filner became San Diego's first Democratic mayor in nearly 30 years. In his first month, he ordered the city to stop referring medical marijuana code violation cases to the city attorney for prosecution. As a result, some marijuana dispensaries stayed open despite orders to shut down. The city attorney is our attorney, so we can direct him on things. If the city council and the mayor agree that he should not be doing using this zoning stuff, you know, to persecute people, then we can say that to him, and he can't do it. 
Filner also publicly feuded with City Council President Todd Gloria and City Attorney Jan Goldsmith. One argument centered on a hotel fee negotiation between the city and officials of the Tourism Marketing District. The three-month debate crisscrossed city meetings and court hearings. Right now, they are not living up to the agreement. They have not given the 5 percent. They, they say they're not intending to do it. They said you're going to get the leftovers. I want that money because it's so important to our community to give the money off the top. And when they do that, uh, the agreement will says they'll get the rest of their money. He made Plaza de Panama in Balboa Park more pedestrian-friendly by ripping out 60 parking spots and through an emergency finding, hired a firm to battle the stench of bird poop long plaguing La Jolla. And when I became mayor, they said it would take about two years to get the permits to deal with this. And I said, well, that's not acceptable. One of his ongoing initiatives was strengthening San Diego's relationship with its southern neighbor. He opened an office in Tijuana and made national news with a proposal to co-host a cross-border Summer Olympics. May marked a significant month for the mayor. He negotiated new leases for city offices downtown, saving the city $15.8 million. He also brokered a five-year agreement with the city employees that was estimated to save the city $25 million alone in its first year. John Rossman, KPBS News. Leaders of the effort to recall the mayor say that his response is unacceptable. They say they are still planning to begin collecting signatures on Sunday. If Filner is recalled or resigns, he wouldn't be the first San Diego mayor to leave office before his term was up. Back in 1934, John Forward resigned for unknown reasons. In 1942, Mayor Percy Benbaugh died in office. Pete Wilson resigned in 1983 to become a U.S. senator. Two years later, Roger Hedgecock was forced to resign in 1985 over a campaign finance scandal. And in 2005, Dick Murphy resigned after being called the worst mayor in America by Time magazine. That happened over the pension scandal here in San Diego. But no San Diego mayor has ever been recalled. Peggy Pico finds out what happens to a city when a mayor leaves. I caught up with UC San Diego political science professor Steve Erie on campus. He is the author of the book Paradise Plundered, Fiscal Crisis and Governance Failures in San Diego. He's here to help us walk through the two scenarios of what happens if the mayor resigns or is recalled. So thanks for talking with us today, Steve. Good to be here. Now let's start with this resignation. We're now under the strong mayor system. So how does this make this mayor leaving the office, if he does, different than the four other mayors who have resigned? Well, the four mayors who have resigned was under the council manager system where there was an automatic line of succession. The deputy mayor who handled business when the mayor was out of town or incapacitated took over. But under the strong mayor system, all bets are off because you have separation of powers. So what will happen if there is a resignation and depending upon how much time is left in the term. Filner has a long time left. What that basically means is that the council will schedule an election, a special election within 90 days. The problem is it looks like there will be no mayor during that period. Okay, the no mayor part, that's interesting because it's my understanding and we had been told until recently that the city council president, Todd Gloria, would automatically be the interim mayor. Is that true? That's not according to my reading, right, of the article in the city charter. We're in unchartered waters, okay? It's a new system. It's never been tested, the stress tested, like this before. Uh, he, you would think, would be the heir apparent, but the reading of the charter is that you have an interim or acting mayor only if there's a year or less left to fill out a term. For a three-year period, it's a special election, and it looks like the charter, and this is the Prop F, which I helped write, and the 2007 reforms that made it permanent, it looks like basically nobody's in charge in the executive branch 
until, until that election. Until there's an actual election. election. Uh, could that change in the interim as they're trying to uh, kind of scramble and get this charter changed? Well, this is the thing is, this is charter. This is not municipal code, okay? And I think a lot of people are going to become sort of government attorneys uh, very, very quickly. And to realize what's in the charter, because that requires a change, a vote of the people, versus what's in the municipal code just requires the city council. As far as you know... Uh, let's just say Todd Gloria or one of mm -hmm. the city council members are the interim mayor. Would they be able to function as the mayor? Would they be able to veto things? Would they be able to sign contracts in the city's interest? If it is, you know, someone appointed by the city council as the mayor, then they have the full powers of the mayor. The thing is, with the long term, it looks like the remaining for Filner, it looks very much like we may not have a mayor, we'll have a special election instead. In other words, there's no automatic plan of succession the way there was with deputy mayors under the council managers. Well, let's move on to the recall scenario. Now, mm -hmm. Filner would be the first San Diego mayor to leave the office this way if there is a recall. What makes our recall process so uh, difficult? Well, there are two things. One is the high bar. 15% of registered voters. That's on the high end in terms of California cities. The second 15 is of registered of voters, of registered that voters need, need, a need to sign to sign to put it on. Relative to that, remember, this is occurring in late August and early September when there's a lot of San Diegans out of town. And the other thing is, instead of them, we have a lot of tourists that have been hearing this right on late night TV. They may sign, but their signatures will be thrown out. The other thing is the short period of time, right? August 18th to like September 26th. That's not a lot of time. Now, having said that, it used to be worse in San Diego. Up until the 1940s, it took 25%. What we need to do, and this is in the municipal code, this can be changed by the city council. They can override a mayor's veto. What needs to be done is to bring it in accord with the state standard, which is 12% of registered voters signing. That's Governor Gray Davis when he was recalled. Right. And they lengthen the period to about 120 days. Right. So they, can, you know, they have a, a guide to follow. So Roger Hedgecock resigned under a scandal, but went on to have, of course, a popular uh, talk radio show. What lessons, if any, have we learned from uh, political scandals here in San Diego? I don't think we really learn lessons because our memories sort of end three or six months after the fact. It's not only scandals. Look at the wildfires of 2003 and 2007. They were, you know, forgotten within six months. The thing about San Diego is as long as the sun is out and you can get to the beach, right, everything is fine in America's finest city. Do you think the mayor is counting on that people have short memories? Oh, I think he's, I think he's betting heavily on that as we speak. All right, political science professor Steve Erie, thanks so much. You're welcome. Our continuing coverage of the story is online at kpbs.org slash news slash Filner. The Federal Aviation Administration has turned down an application from a fledgling airline trying to launch commercial service from Carlsbad. The agency says the California Pacific Airlines didn't meet minimum standards in several areas of its application. California Pacific has a month to resubmit its application. If it doesn't, the effort will officially be over. Customs and Border Patrol officials are hoping technology helps them speed travelers across the U.S.-Mexico border. The San Ysidro border crossing is the busiest land border crossing in the world. More than 45,000 cars cross here each day, and so do 25,000 people on foot. Border officials have tried to use high-tech tools to help speed automobile traffic across the U.S.-Mexico border. Now they're trying to use some of those same tools in the pedestrian lane. Specifically, pedestrians can use the quick-moving ready lane. However, Port of Entry Director Sidney Aki says they'll need documents that contain radio frequency ID chips. Basically, we envision U.S. passport cards, newer versions of the lawful permanent resident cards, laser visa, border crossing cards uh, developed since 2008 with an RFID chip embedded. We'll be able to scan efficiently in the kiosk and, of course, the information will be readily accessible to the officers. Aki says not everyone has those new high-tech documents, but the lure of a shorter line might provide motivation. 
He says travelers will do a job that border officers used to do. The passenger will be able to scan their own documents when they're in line. The CBP officer receive that information, call the traveler over, and already have information ready, available, and already reviewed, ask a few questions, and from there, enter the United States. Hockey says that could trim up to 10 seconds off each person's wait in line. Multiplied by thousands, the savings could be significant. A federal report says a reserve on the Tijuana River estuary is the most vulnerable in the nation to the effects of climate change. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is looking at places where rivers meet the ocean. The agency says the Tijuana River Reserve is the most sensitive when it comes to sea level rise and changes in water quality. In 2011, the English language newspaper China Daily estimated 60,000 students from China would attend an American summer camp. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert tells us about one new camp bringing some of those students to San Diego. Seventeen-year-old Bi Yan is finishing up a woodworking project on one of the last mornings of a four-week summer camp. He and 12 other students from China spent mornings alongside American kids at Francis Parker and Linda Vista in classes like this one. That's one of the things Bi has liked most about the program. This program really improved my English level. Uh, I can um, easily to talk to other people in English. Uh, before that, I, when I talk to somebody in English, I, I always get nervous. Tim Katzman heads summer and after-school programs at Francis Parker. He says the summer camp is part of keeping the school relevant. We live in an international city. We're in a world that gets smaller every day. If we don't uh, uh, um, have our kids understand that having a global awareness is, is an important part of their education, indeed an important part of who they are, then we're, we're not giving them a complete education. But it's the intensive four-hour afternoon sessions that B and five other students go to, like this one that starts out with a conversation about making the most of college tours that Katzman thinks sets their program apart from more established international summer camps at East Coast boarding schools. To the best of our knowledge, none of the schools to this point have put in this, this college university application process initiative and I think that's that has resonated with families and and kids and educators in China. 16 year old Mohan C says working on how to write an American style college application essay has been most helpful. I know how to say the essays because it's so difficult for Chinese students. Uh, we just know how to write some beautiful sentences but we haven't got very good logical idea in our mind. But Bob Hurley, the Francis Parker College counselor running the afternoon sessions, says he has a bigger goal, giving the students a sense of control and understanding of the college application process. Some of the personal nature of the admissions review, they're going to take into account um, recommendations, uh, their essays, uh, and really read into it and not just give their statistics to a computer to have that spit out a decision. If they get into an American college, the Parker campers will be among the nearly 200,000 Chinese students pursuing a higher education in the U.S. According to a report this spring to the National Association for College Admission Counseling, more than half of these students use an agent in China to help with the application process. That report and Hurley say rapid growth in the demand for agents means not all are qualified or reputable. What we hear and the danger that we hear oftentimes for the students who do come from China is that they're preyed upon by agents right, who are trying to place them and we'll make some promises of we'll get you into such and such a college. To broaden their horizons beyond the Ivy League schools students already know about, they visited a range of Southern California schools like San Diego State, UC San Diego, UCLA, the University of Southern California, and the Claremont McKenna Colleges. Hurley hopes it'll make the students more proactive in selecting the schools they'll apply to. So if they can do that and take that initiative, be the one in charge of it, then they won't feel like the process is being done to them. Even with the program's academic focus, 15-year-old Zheng Huzha says the last four weeks have not resembled her normal school life. Classes in China are, to, uh, are very big. You know, many, many students in the class. And sometimes teacher will always talk talking him, herself or himself. And uh, she or her will, won't hear what you are talking about. But uh, here, 
Teacher will ask you questions, and mostly the students are speaking. Zheng and her summer classmates each paid almost seven thousand dollars for the four weeks of classes, day trips, and family homestays. Katzman says the primary goal, though, wasn't to make money for the school. We're doing it for a different reason than generating revenue. That may come somewhere down the line, but it's certainly not been the motivator. Down the line, Katzman sees Parker growing its connections to China. This fall, they'll host a conference for seven California private schools that are also entering the market of academic programs for Chinese students. They'll talk about what seems to be working and how best to grow. Kyla Calvert, KPBS News. Hundreds of foreign trained doctors in San Diego are finding a path back to practicing medicine. The Welcome Back Center at Grossmont Community College is working with 1,400 foreign trained physicians to get a U.S. medical license. That process takes years to complete. They face uh, very high standards in order to pass these state boards. There's applications, there's, um, there's agencies that they have to work through, there's examinations, and of course, they're, you know, they're studying in a language that's a second language for them. The center walks the medical professionals through each step and helps them learn English on the side. Patterson says many of the doctors are from Iraq and most who successfully received their license have returned to their neighborhood clinics as primary care physicians. Summer break is over for many student athletes and as Peggy Pico explains, there is a new game in town that trains high school teams to tackle sports injuries. The American Academy of Pediatrics reports about one-third of all childhood injuries are sports-related, and doctors say the injuries are starting earlier. Here to talk about prevention and treatment are sports medicine pediatrician Dr. Paul Stricker and Beth Mellon, mother of a student seriously injured during a high school game. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stricker, um, we're about to start a new school year here. What types of injuries do you typically see at the beginning of a school year? Uh, both the acute uh, injuries where they get hurt on the field just because that's a fluke thing uh, but we also see a lot of the overuse injuries primarily with kids that were not in shape during the summer they didn't take advantage of uh, regularly exercising and so they go and then the coach runs them to pieces and they have a lot of overuse injuries so stress fractures um, that kind of thing shin splints etc okay and Beth now your son was seriously hurt uh, late in the season not early on on this uh, tell us what happened mm -hmm. it was in May of 2009 and Tommy was running for a ground ball in his final high school lacrosse game and collided with another player and a very very benign hit but unfortunately it was a rotational hit that turned his head and he suffered a C1 fracture, so he fractured his neck. Yeah, and we're actually looking at a, a video of that. He's running along the field, he gets a front hit, and did you know at the time that there was uh, something serious? Did he know? No, no, we did not. It looked very benign. As you can see, if the tape is rolling, you can see that it looks very benign. Um, there was so much pressure to have him get up, return to play, but fortunately, we had access to a certified athletic trainer who encouraged him to stay down and, and recognize that he was there was some nerve involvement. And we're just seeing video now. How did he recover from this? He had, uh, uh, it looks like he was in spinal traction. He, um, yes. He was um, transported immediately to ICU. He had a clot forming in his brain, and he um, recovered from that and went into an Aspen collar, and then unfortunately had to go into what you're probably seeing is a halo device. Right, absolutely. And he was in that for several months. And um, but, but now he's okay. He is. He's alive. He's walking. He's going to be a senior at University of San Diego. Very, very fortunate. Okay. And um, Dr. Stricker, I know that serious head injuries and, and spine injuries like this are, are, are rather rare when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, sports for kids. What are sort of these overuse and strain injuries that are more common? Well, when any child is pushed more than their body can handle, whether it's doing too many sports or uh, doing them too long without any rest, or they're pushed excessively hard, then their bodies just break down and it's hard to heal. So we'll see lots of, of stress fractures and tendonitis and those kinds of overuse problems. I think the big concern is now we're seeing things in young kids that we never saw before, like stress fractures in an eight-year-old, and it's just, uh, it, it's and strange And these can have some long-term effects. Absolutely, yeah. Some of these injuries, some of the knee injuries certainly can haunt these people for the rest of their life. Okay. And Beth, um, your experience, of course, more serious than that, but still a, a long, has some long-term results. This sort of helped motivate you about uh, 
starting Advocates for Injured Athletes. Tell us about that program. Uh, we started a foundation and the message is, the mission is really sports education, sports safety education. So we um, want to get the message out there that every field needs an athletic trainer on the sidelines to treat these kinds of catastrophic injuries. And then we started a program called Athletes Saving Athletes. And that's the peer mentoring group. Correct. It's based on the stories of three athletes that, um, that fortunately survived catastrophic injuries and they tell their stories and they educate other athletes about. And we're seeing the, cla the classroom video here, they teach them CPR, they teach them the basics, right, to keep yes. them uh, safe. Okay. And um, Dr. Stricker, what are some of your tips? So maybe you're helping on mm -hmm. the side of if the injuries on the field, what would your tips be to parents or coaches about preventing these injuries? Yeah, the best uh, news that we can give them and what we try to give them every day when we see them at Scripps is, hey, think about what you can do during the summer to stay in shape. Uh, don't be out of shape. If your child has grown, please check and make sure their equipment still fits appropriately so that they're not at risk for injury. And just uh, try to be aware of the warning signs if they're not as happy, if they're not having as much fun, if they're complaining a lot or finding excuses not to go, then think about uh, maybe uh, putting them in a different activity or kind of spreading things out a little bit. Okay. Well, I certainly want to let folks know there's a whole lot more. They can link up to your website by going to our website, kpbs.org. Beth Mellon and Dr. Paul Stricker, thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. You can look for more of the same when it comes to our weather pattern. Coastal temperatures going to be comfortable in the mid-70s for the next couple of days. It'll be up in the mid, or, uh, mid to upper 80s for the inland valleys. 80s up in the mountains as well, and if you like a little heat with your sunshine, go out to the desert areas up to 110 degrees. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks very much for joining us. Have yourself a great evening.